It's all about you, Jesus, and all this is for you, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me. Good morning and welcome to the Busby Parish online service for the first Sunday in Lent. So let's open our ears to hear God's word our mouths to sing God's praise, and our hearts to receive his grace. Call it for the first Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin, give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your Spirit. As you know our weaknesses, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is taken from Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. God's covenant with Noah. Then God, God told Noah and his sons, I am making a covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals you brought with you, all these birds and livestock and wild animals. I solemnly never will send another flood to kill all living creatures and destroy the earth. And God said, I am giving you a sign as evidence of my eternal covenant with you and all living creatures. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my permanent promise to you and to all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will be seen in the clouds. And I will remember my covenant with you and with everything that lives. Never again will there be a flood that will destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, yes. This is the sign of my covenant, 
with all the creatures of the earth. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord is a great God. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice, harden not your hearts. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Economy of Love I don't think you need me to tell you, in its laudable effort to combat the current pandemic, the government has had to borrow a great deal of money. We are now in quite serious debt. Not only this country, but many others too. This is, of course, rightly a matter of some concern, to add to the many others. Not only have countries been borrowing, but companies and corporations too. And we don't have to look far back into our history, 2008, 1929, when the level of get debt gave rise to an enormous loss of confidence. A loss of confidence primarily by and in, indeed in our banks. Now I'm a priest and engineer, no a common economist, but I believe the reasoning goes something like this. To make a profit, the banks lend money to public institutions, to companies and of course to us. The money is lent as always on the condition that it will be repaid. To be honest, the banks don't have enough money to lend out themselves, so they borrow money in turn from other banks. But where do those other banks find money to lend out themselves? Well, as luck would have it, those banks have a lot of loans out to their customers too. So in a way, the banks do not have the money, but they do have a lot of people that owe them money. And that means they have collateral, collateral and strength. This means they can lend out money on that basis. Hmm. It is as if we've all borrowed money to go for a ride on the fair. Round and round and up and up goes the money, go round until someone realises the money, we, our banks, and indeed the countries have to repay is far, far more than we can ever, ever be expected to pay. In other words, someone realises the conditions on which the loans were made can never quite be met. So the man that runs the merry-go-round pulls the lever, the pretty lights go out, the jolly yet hypnotic music finishes, all goes silent, and it all comes to a sudden, grinding halt. So much for the financial economy. But I wonder if the financial economy is a little like, what should we call it, the social economy. I wonder if our human love is often like this too. I can love you, but I expect and even demand something in return. These are my conditions. Flowers. A phone call, physical contact and congress, patience, reliability, gifts, cards, a kind word or two. This offer in return is not a bad thing in itself, except that so often these things are not given and received as a free gift, but as a condition, a repayment as it were, a repayment without which little by little I will fall out of love, tear up our neatly written contract and turn and walk sadly away. So what about our readings? After the flood, God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. With these words, God makes a covenant with Noah, but not only Noah, but with all of us, and all creatures, including dogs and cats, and yes, nematode worms too. What does this covenant mean? My, my dictionary defines covenant as a bond entered into voluntarily by two parties, in which each pledges to do something for the other. By this definition, it is a bit like a loan agreement, I suppose. We're not forced to take out loans, we voluntarily enter into a bond to give and receive and repay money. However, God's covenant is not quite like this. God makes a promise not to bring about not to bring about a flood to destroy all life again. But he does not demand from Noah or his descendants a similar bond of obedience. It is a free bond, a free gift with no reciprocation demanded. It is not that God is willing to tolerate our sin, but rather than send another flood, he sends his own son to deal with our sin. Notice also the pattern of our gospel reading. Normally, even that most unselfish type of human love, the bond between a parent and child, comes with some conditions. Before I praise you, my child, you must do something worthy of praise. 
After you pass your exams, I will reward you. After you win the race, I will give you a treat. Not so with God. The order is different with him, and our reading Jesus is yet to be tested by Satan in the desert, or through Peter, or through Gethsemane, or on the cross. Jesus is yet to start his ministry. Yet before any of these things occur, the Father declares, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Rather than kill, rather than send a flood, God sends Jesus, who is willing to die. Rather than punish, God is willing to forgive. God adds the cross to the sign of the rainbow. And in both of these symbols, the rainbow and the cross, we see God's unhesitant willingness to love without condition. The affirmation and unconditional love from the Father has an immediate effect on his Son. I don't believe Jesus goes in the, into the desert to prove his worth. Rather, he is driven perhaps to contemplate. What does such love mean for me? How shall I respond? We learn in the other Gospels that Satan tempts Jesus to direct his love elsewhere with offers of reward for obedience to him. But Jesus is not shaken. Being in receipt of and reciprocating God's unconditional love can only have one outcome. And Jesus declares it. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. So what does this mean for us now that the, the season of Lent, that season of introspection and contemplation is upon us? It means that in, condition, in addition to your normal journey to the foot of the cross, by fasting and obedience and abstinence, I recommend you take a parallel journey. Well, that journey is to seek out signs of love, given without condition or thought of reward. Over the next few weeks, I urge you to look for love given freely, simply because that is the way God loves. When we find such love, we find ourselves in a place that is unlike the common human experience. That really is a true wilderness. Be warned, in these places you will find Satan as well. He will whisper in your ear that such love can only lead to people taking advantage. So step back. It will, play, it will be a place of dark clouds and also a place of bright rainbows, a place where wild animals may well threaten to, to devour you, but also a place where you will be waited on by angels. For the places where we find unconditional love, both in others and ourselves, are places where the kingdom of God is near. This may be no way to run an economy, but is the economy really where God's unconditional love is to be found. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. As we begin this play, let us move off into the desert to communicate with our God. Lord God, we come with all our muddled priorities, conflicting genders, to be made whole as the body of Christ, to renounce evil so as to be equipped to announce the kingdom of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we come into the world's clamour with the world's clamour in our ears, with comfort zones beckoning us, but the pain of injustice refusing to be shut out. We come for the world's heat and an end to all lying and deceit. We pray for all those affected by conflicts throughout the world, for the homeless, for the low, and those living in poverty and fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, come with demands of home, family, work and expectations warring in us for space and attention. We come on behalf of those too busy or too exhausted to pray that our daily lives may be washed in your peace, ordered in holiness and lit up with joy. We pray for all children enjoying half term this week and pray that the teachers will feel refreshed to start online learning again. Lord, 
in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we come with endless pain and suffering of our brothers and sisters all over the world who are aching physically, emotionally or spiritually. We come to ask for your comfort and healing love. We pray and give thanks for all those frontline workers who, although they are exhausted, are continuing to treat all those who are sick and we give thanks for all those involved in the mass vaccination program. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we come to realign our lives in the context of your easy and to commend to your love our own loved ones who have passed through earthly death to the life which has no ending. Especially for Jay, who was buried at St. Peter's on Wednesday, and we ask for your love and comfort for all her family and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we come with thankfulness for the love and for the call to holiness. Give us the grace to respond to your calling. Merciful Father, at these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I lay.
As our service draws to a close, let's leave with the sound of God's blessing ringing in our ears. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst you, and in name of you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Goodbye. It's all about you, Jesus, and all this is for you, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me, as if you should do things my way, you alone are God. Surrender to your ways. Jesus, lover of my soul, all consuming fire is in.
Surrender to your 